Hebrews chapter 10 this morning. Hebrews chapter 10 in the Word of God. We're going to look together at, the, at uh, a fourth message in this series about approaching God. Now, Brother Rudy read to you at the beginning of, of the service this evening, this, this morning, Psalm 86. And uh, I don't know if, if you were paying attention very, very uh, astutely there, but the, the key thing there in Psalm 86 is you see David's boldness in approaching God. And if you saw the top of Psalm 86, it says a prayer of David. A prayer of David. There's only two psalms that say that at the top, as far as I know, uh, a prayer of David. And this is one of them. But, but uh, David's prayer here, it shows certain things. It shows worship to God. It's a prayer, but it's filled with praise as well. And that's our first sermon that we talked about. We talked about how we need to approach God with worship in, in our hearts, knowing who He is and who we are. And then he also speaks there about uh, his, uh, his need for forgiveness and mercy in verse 3 in Psalm 86. And we'll be looking at Hebrews in just a moment, but I just want to show you this, that he also uh, is, is calling upon God for forgiveness there. And, uh, you know, we need to approach God with humility. That was our second sermon in this series. Humility and confession from Psalm 51, David, David's great... Um, prayer of, of confession to God of his great sin of adultery. But then uh, then we, we talked about how we need to approach God with thank, thankful hearts, approaching God with thanksgiving. And here, he's definitely thanking God in verse 15 for his compassion, his grace, his long-suffering, his mercy, and for his truth. And so he's, he's thanking God for his goodness to him. And, you know, if we are able to come with those three things, worship, confession, and thanksgiving, then we can get to this week's uh, message. Can we approach God with boldness? Can we approach God with boldness? And uh, it seems like a strange thing at first if you, for new Christians to think that, that they can pray. Praying is, is, is strange and new, but the Bible is very clear that we can approach God boldly. Now, now let's turn over to Hebrews chapter 10. And... Uh, We'll, we'll find the answer. <clears throat> Hebrews chapter 10 and verse number 19, it says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way, which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for he is faithful that promised. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much for... Uh, for the way that has been made for us to approach you. Uh, Father, we know that, that uh, through the Word of God, uh, we can approach you through, through, uh, through the Bible. Father, we know that we can approach you through the preaching. And Father, that you're trying to approach us and speak to us. But Father, I pray that we can enter your presence with boldness, uh, knowing that you've made that way for us. Father, we, we, may we be filled to this morning with all the things we've talked about already, with, with worship of your holiness with, uh, with um, thankfulness for your everlasting help that you, you give to us, Father, with, with confession for knowing who we are as well. Father, may, may we realize that not only that you're holy, but that we're unworthy to be here, but may we realize that you've made a way. And Father, we thank you for each person that's here. We ask that you'll bless our congregation this morning, those who are here and those who are not, so many needs. But Father, may we realize that we have somewhere to go with our needs this morning. It's in Christ Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. Now, prayer doesn't come automatically as a natural thing. Uh, most people, uh, they don't stop to think that they need prayer. They, they don't like to pray because it's an assault on, on your, in our, our, we try to be totally autonomous, totally self-sufficient. 
that's part of our sinful nature, isn't it? We, we don't like to ask for help, especially guys. Mm. Don't like to ask for directions or don't like to ask for help when they're lost. Uh, you know, I, I, I didn't have time to ask for directions this morning. <laughs> I was just trying to figure it out on my own, but I, I, I probably should have done and stopped. I probably could have saved myself some time. Uh, but I couldn't leave my mother-in-law stranded in the middle of Peterborough <laughs> this morning, but uh, I'm glad I was able to do that. But uh, if I had stopped and asked for directions, maybe I wouldn't have gone the wrong way twice on my way to get here. But, but uh, we, we like to be in control of our own lives, don't we? We like to be self-made people. But prayer is realizing we can't be that. We can't do that. We, we're not self-made people. We rely upon God. We, we need someone, uh, someone bigger than ourselves. And when we're in the lowest part of our life, we, we, we realize that and we take God out. But we shouldn't just use God as a spare tire, you know, uh, hidden away in our boot, uh, and only taking Him out in times of emergency. Uh, but we sh He should be... Uh, he should be in the driving seat. We should we should be asking him for every direction of our life on a day on a day to day basis. So here it says it says there in verse nineteen, having therefore brethren boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus by a new and living way. Now, when you first started learning how to drive a car, it probably didn't come very naturally to you at first. It probably uh, was a scary thing when you first got behind the wheel. And it was awkward, you know, but uh, over time, you get a little bit more bold in, in the way that you do it. You know, that's, that's the same with prayer. It might be a little bit awkward when you're a first, first a, a brand new Christian. But, uh, but then, honestly, um, it, it, it's a little bit uncomfortable at first, but then it becomes more of a natural part of our lives. Like, it should become more of a natural part of our lives, like breathing. But yet, even seasoned Christians... They neglect it so many times, don't they? And uh, so this message is for all of us this morning. You know, some people, they don't feel worthy to approach God. Um, but, of course, that's, that's what we, we talked about before. We, we need to come with confession on our, on our hearts. Uh, he, he knows our hearts already. Um, some people think that God's too busy, you know, keeping the, the vast universe going. Uh, too busy to, to listen to... Uh, or to care about something that you'd, or be interested in something that you'd have to say. But the truth is that God's created us uh, for His pleasure. Uh, he's created us, that's what uh, Revelation 4.11 says, He's created us for the purpose of fellowshipping with Him, having communion with Him. God's very interested uh, in all that He's doing, in having fellowship with Him. It's His will uh, that we approach Him. It's His will that we spend time with Him in prayer. And fellowship with Him, and that's a thrilling thing. But it's a it's a humbling thing as well that the God of all the universe would feel that way about you and about me. But uh, we should be able to come to Him boldly to enter His presence. The book of, of Hebrews uh, we we've preached from Hebrews before, but it's written to three groups of people. But the main group of people it's written to, and the and the the, the group that He's addressing in this uh, particular passage of Scripture. Uh, he talks there in verse 25 about not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another so much the more as you see that day approaching. He's talking here to believers, isn't he? Uh, he says uh, exhorting one another. He's talking about people who are already saved. He's talking here to the first group of people that Hebrews has written to. He's writing to Hebrew Christians. Hebrew Christians who had put their faith in Christ Jesus, but they were they were not quite convinced of how they should come out and make the big transition from the legalistic, uh, the legalistic system of Judaism uh, and, and into this new and living way. And so the book of Hebrews is trying to teach these people that Jesus Christ, He came to take the old way uh, a, a way of approaching God, Judaism, and He's establishing a new way of approaching God. You know, we don't have to approach God with a sacrifice because Jesus Christ was the ultimate sacrifice. We can approach Him boldly because of Jesus. That's the only way. Now, look at verse 9 of chapter 10. It says, Then said He, Lo, I come to do Thy will, O God. He taketh away the first, that He may establish the second. So this new way, the second way of approaching God, this new way or this New Testament, only Jesus could provide. And then in verses 10 to 12, we didn't read that yet, but let's read that together. It says, 
verse 10, by the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oftentimes the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. His job was finished. He, he made one sacrifice forever. The old way of approaching God, which is outlined you know, in the Old Testament, uh, the, the, the tabernacle, the temple, the Levites, the, the priests, the sin offerings, the meal offerings, all of those things, all of those things required animals to be sacrificed and their blood to be shed every single day in the tabernacle or in the temple. But the new way is this. Jesus Christ, once and for all, He offered Himself on the cross of Calvary, and then He sat down on the right hand of the throne of God forever. And then He raised Himself from the dead. And it's that that makes the new way for you and me today. It says there in verse 19, having therefore, what's the therefore, therefore? Because of what Jesus did for us, we can have boldness. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. That's a reference to the fact that Jesus died on the cross. He made this way for us. So we can enter, we can enter in prayer with boldness today. I don't know if you, if you, uh, have boldness with God or not when you go into Him. You know, when I was uh, growing up, I was uh, went to a Christian school uh, up to ninth grade, or up to eighth grade, I'm sorry, uh, ninth grade, I'm sorry, tenth grade, I ha had to be homeschooled because the Christian school only went up to ninth grade. And uh, and yet, my uh, my dad didn't really want to send me to the public school just yet. I did go, end up going 11th to 12th grade, but for tenth grade, one year I was homeschooled, but I did my homeschooling work at the school where my dad taught at the Christian school. And so a lot of times I would have no idea what what a math problem was about, but I could go to the other the math teacher and I could talk to them or this, that, and the other, and they, they had this thing going. But uh, there was some times that um, I just needed, I just needed uh, maybe some lunch or something. And my, my relationship with my dad was, was such a relationship that no matter what, if, if he knew that if I came into his classroom, even if he was in the middle of teaching, I must need something. So he would stop whatever he was doing, and he would he would say, "What what is it, Jonathan?" And I would tell him. And sometimes I would just walk right into his classroom, and I knew which drawer he had money in, and I would I would say, "Hey, Dad, I need some money for lunch," you know. And uh, you know he would he would uh, maybe give me some. That's not enough, you know. He give me. But how how come I was so bold to go into my dad's classroom when he was so busy, you know, all these things? He could I could have thought, well, he's too busy, you know. But but I walked right in. And I spoke to him, and he gave me what I needed. Why? Because he is our Father. In Matthew chapter 7, turn with me to Matthew chapter 7. Now, the Old Testament never referred to God as a Father, really. Not really. Um, not, in a, not in a way that we can address him as a Father, but Jesus introduced this new idea he says in verse 9, After this manner therefore pray ye, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And now look back up in verse number 6. He says, But thou, when, thy, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet, and when thou shut the door, pray to thy Father, which is in secret. And thy... This, I'm sorry, I'm in chapter 6, aren't I? Uh, chapter 6, verse 6. And thy Father, which is in secret, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. So, we have a heavenly Father... Verse 6 and verse 9 of chapter 6. But then in verse chapter 7, chapter 7, verse 7, we'll get there in the end. It says, Ask and it shall be given you, seek and ye shall find, knock and it shall be opened unto you. For everyone that asketh receiveth, and he that seeketh findeth, and to him that knocketh it shall be opened. Or what man is there of you whom if his son ask bread, will he give him a stone? Or if he ask a fish, will he give him a serpent? If ye then, being evil, know how to give good gifts unto your children, how much more shall your Father, which is in heaven, give good gifts to them that ask Him? You know, it's, it's, we can enter boldly because of the nature of our, of our Father. He is a, he's, a, a, he's plenteous in mercy. And that's exactly what, what, uh, uh, that's exactly what David said in Psalm 86. He talks about God's his mercy, His strength, His love, His grace, His mercy, His... Uh, 
His power, His love, and all those things can cause us to, to approach Him. We should pray to the only true God who's great in power, love, grace, and mercy. That's what, uh, that's what uh, David said. And, and we can approach God. He's the true God. He is still great in power. He's still great in love, and grace, and mercy. But we can come with this new relationship of Him as our Father. Now, in the Old Testament times, no one dared approach God in that way. No one would dare get near the Ark of the Covenant or the Mercy Seat. No one would dare enter into that, that holy chamber the holy, where the Holy of Holies was, the, the, the holiest place of all, uh, of the tabernacle. In fact, there was only one day of the year, the Day of Atonement, when, when the high priest it was the only person who could go. He could go into the Holy of Holies. And he would enter that place of God's holy presence for one reason only, to sprinkle the blood on the mercy seat as a covering for the sins of the people. They, so he was coming with confession. He was coming with worship, with reverence, with awe, with, with uh, thank, thanksgiving that there was a way, that there was a way, a very specific way that, that the people could come to God. But it's still a specific way but the way is different. It's made through the Lord Jesus Christ. He is our high priest. Can you imagine for a moment these Jewish Christians? They'd recently been converted to Christ. They're trying to turn away from Judaism here in the book of Hebrews. Imagine their response when the author of Hebrews said, You can have boldness to enter into the holiest of holies by a new and living way. You can enter in there. That was revolution, a revolutionary idea and a completely new way of thinking and a new way of approaching God. And so, here in Hebrews 10, he also talks about, we can go, in verse 19, he says, uh, having therefore boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus, uh, by a new and living way, uh, which he hath consecrated through us, through the veil. Through the veil. That is to say, his flesh. There was, the Old Testament describes that there was a veil between the holy place and the holy of holies. And that veil literally meant that we're separated from, from God, from the presence of God. And what separates us from God? It's our sin. Our sin separates us from God. And that's what that was a picture of. But these people probably were asking, well, on what basis can we enter boldly into such a close communion with our Creator God, the God of the universe? And he says what basis here in verse 19. They read it again. It says, having therefore boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. So when, why can we come in prayer to so, such a sacred place talking to God? It's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. I think it was uh, Rick and Kerry sang a song, uh, Nothing But the Blood, and that's the only way. And, and, and I was trying to remember some of the lyrics to that song. They, they said, the, the past erasing flood of justice and mercy is found in nothing but the blood. That was a great song that they sang, and that's true, isn't it? It's it's a past erasing flood. It, it's a, a justice and mercy kissed together. But why? Because of the blood. You know, God's holiness and God's mercy. They seem to be opposites. God's justice and God's mercy, and yet uh, they're separated by that veil. And yet, uh, through Christ, both can meet, and we can approach God. John one fourteen says, "And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us." And we beheld His glory, the glory of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. Grace and truth. Grace and justice. He was full of both. And He made the way. He made, he was, he's the one who, who broke down the middle wall of partition. He's the one uh, that, that was torn on the cross. When Jesus died on the cross, His flesh was torn. He was torn. He was, he was tortured. And at the same time, the temple veil was torn from the top to the bottom, when he said, it is finished. And, uh, and the, Mark that talks about that in Mark chapter 15. It says, And Jesus cried with a loud voice and gave up the ghost, and the veil of the temple was rent in twain from the top to the bottom. God was satisfied. He ripped it from the top. This huge uh, curtain about this thick was rent from the top to the bottom. And it was just as if the Heavenly Father was saying, you know, I no longer require these, the old way of the sacrifices. People don't have to go through the sacrificial system or through the high priest. Jesus has made the way. And uh, But how can you know that you can approach God? You know How, how do you know that you can approach God? And uh, you know some, some religions teach that you can't approach God straight on your own, don't they? Some religions teach 
you can't approach God, but this priest, he can approach God. You can't approach God, but if you go through this saint, you can approach God. You can't approach God, but if you come to our church and light this candle, we can help you approach God. But how do we know that we personally can approach God? How do we know that, that's, that none of that stuff is true, that none of that stuff is the way to approach God? How do we know that we can just go on our own? Well, it's because Jesus Christ, he tastes the death for every man. And each one of us can go, you know, you can't approach, how can you approach God? It's not through your church. It's not through your pastor. You know, I'd love to be able to pray with you about things uh, on a one-on-one -on -one basis. But, and uh, it's, it's, a, it's a sweet thing when we can pray together. And it's, the Bible talks about agreeing in prayer, which we might get to a little bit later. But my prayers are no more uh, potent than your prayers are. My prayers don't work any more than your prayers work. Why is that? Because uh, as long as we're both in the right standing with God, both of our prayers can have equal power. Uh, the Bible talks about that in James 5.16. It says, The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. You know, not just a priest, not just a, a pastor, not just, but just a righteous person. The, the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. If you... If you are, are right with God, if you're on praying ground, so to speak, if you've made the, 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 the path, if you've gone through the path of, of worship and confession and thanksgiving, you, you can get to God. Your heart will be prepared to be able to talk to God. Amen. There's no such thing as a, a direct link that's available to some people and not available to other people. And, uh, you know, I, uh, we don't have access to God through Mary. Um, you know, I, I'm not trying to attack any, anybody when I say that. I know some of your friends and family believe that, but we believe what we believe comes from the Bible, doesn't it? The Bible's our only rule of faith and practice. And so we don't pray through the saints. The Bible, there's not a single reference in the Bible that talks about anybody praying through anyone else except for the Lord Jesus Christ. And so what we believe comes from the Bible. There's no scriptural evidence of people praying through any other medium. And uh, we, we can't approach God through our own merit either. We can't approach God through a person, through, a, through another person. We can't approach God through our own merit. Some people teach that. You know, but uh, Jesus Christ made the way. <clears throat> you know, uh, we, can't, we can't make the way through to God. We can't get our prayers to go all the way past this ceiling and into outer space, you know. Our, our, our voices only get so far, but, but our prayers go all the way to the throne room of God. We can't make that happen, but Jesus Christ makes that happen. He's our high priest. He is standing there making intercession for us. You know, sometimes in Tennessee, they're in the mountains, they have these signs, you know, that say, um, that say, we talk about falling rocks, you know. Sometimes the rocks would fall across the road on the way to my parents' house in the mountains, and during big floods, there would the whole road would be covered, and we couldn't get our way through there. But those big tractors, they could push those rocks down into the creek in just a few minutes. You know, we we couldn't do anything to to get through there through those roads. But but there's somebody who could, and you know, there's no way that we could get through our sin to God. But there was somebody with more power, with more ability. He he is perfect, and the Bible says that. Let's look at Hebrews chapter four. Verse 15. It says, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feelings of our infirmities, yet was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He was somebody who was perfect, somebody who was stronger, somebody who was without sin. He came and he made the way to God. You know, it's not us trying to work our way to heaven or earn the right to be there. Nobody has the right to be there. Charles Spurgeon said, Charles Spurgeon, he said, holiness, holiness is not the way to Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ is the way to holiness. And uh, so many people think that they can approach God if they're good enough. But the Bible says we're all as an unclean thing. And all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags in the book of Isaiah, uh, chapter 64. And uh, we can only approach God because of what he's done for us. We can approach God boldly. But another thing that we see from uh, Psalm 86 and from this passage also here in Hebrews chapter 10 is that we can uh, approach God personally. I've already touched on this a little bit, 
but it says in verses 20 and 21, it says, and having an, of chapter 10 of Hebrews, it says, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart in full assurance of faith. Paul doesn't say, I'll approach God for you. No, he says, let us approach God. Let us draw near. It's a personal matter. And so uh, we have a high priest. He's a high priest over the house of God. It says in verse 21. It says, having a high priest over the house of God. What is the house of God there? Well, the house of God there is talking about the church, the local body of Christ. And uh, when we come to understand that Jesus Christ is our, is our high priest, that's going to change your life. He is your high priest. And uh, the Bible talks about how he's a high priest who's touched with the feeling of our infirmities. You know, thank God we're not praying to a stone God. We're not praying to uh, some church or to just a mere man. We're praying to the great high priest, Jesus Christ. He knows all about us. He knows the feeling of our infirmities. And, uh, you know, maybe we're going through, somebody's going through a hard time this morning. Jesus knows what that's like. Maybe somebody's gone through suffering. Jesus knows what, th knows what that is like. You can talk to him about absolutely anything, any time of the day. And you can go to him personally. He's a personal God. Look here again at Hebrews chapter 10. And it says in, uh, or I'm sorry, Hebrews chapter 4 and verse 16. We looked at uh, Hebrews 4 a second ago, but back to Hebrews 4 again. In verse 16, uh, it we, we read verse 15 already, but it says, Because we have this high priest, it says, Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Grace to help in time of need. There's so many times when we need grace to help in time of need. And uh, we, we need him. There's, there's so many people, they try to do all sorts of... When I was in Moldova for two weeks... Uh, when I was uh, in college, we went to some of the churches there, and everywhere that we looked, there was uh, in those churches there was idolatry on the walls, uh, things everywhere. And but we looked, we looked, and there was this little lady. She had tears in her eyes. She was weeping. She was on her knees, on her face, trying to light a candle. Obviously, she was trying to to, to get her prayers heard. She was trying to approach God, but but she was asking for penance. She was. We saw her put money afterwards into the into the thing to try to get maybe the money would help her her prayers to be heard. There was a little box there, and people would, would stuff it full of money. You know, all these things. There was a confessional booth off to the side. People trying to get into the confessional booth. They're they're trying. They're trying. They're um, they're desperate to try to get through to God. And uh, you know. Uh, trying to get all this money, they, they have sorrow. They're, but we think about the, the bondage these people are in in a, in a religious system. You know, the, the, the confessional booth, it had a, a, a little sign on it, and I asked what the interpreter what that was. He said, that's the hours that the confessional booth is open. You know, but aren't you glad we don't have to just go to God at certain hours of the day. Amen. We can go to God 24-7. You know, actually, they did just make a new app where you can confess on the app on your phone to the priest. But I don't know, he probably has to, there's certain times of the night where, where he's probably asleep and he can't read that app message until the next morning. But we have a God, you know, it doesn't just go to some database somewhere, it goes straight to the throne room of God and he hears us and he answers, he, he, he's, he delights in hearing us 24 hours a day and it's free of charge. It's available free of charge. We don't have to pay anything to try to light a candle to get our... He's paid the price for us already on the cross. And so we need to come to Him boldly. We need to come to Him through Jesus Christ. He's the only way. But then uh, it's, we, we can come to Him to find grace and mercy in time of need. But we also need to come with a prepared heart. You know, sometimes, uh, sometimes our hearts aren't ready to come to God boldly. You know, but we can. We, it says in look. Let's look at chapter ten again. We're almost done here. It says in verse twenty-two of chapter ten. Uh, let us. Sorry, just one second. It says, "Let us draw near with a true heart, in full assurance of faith, having our hearts sprinkled uh, from an evil conscience." You know, we we have to draw near with a true heart, with full assurance of faith. You know. Uh, Again, I, I asked you this a couple weeks ago, but do you think that when you come to God 
and you have sin in your life, don't you think God can see right through that and He knows about the sin in your life? You know, we, we sometimes we try to we try to come to Him and act like He doesn't know about it. You know, but He does. He does know about it. We need to confess our sin to Him. We need to come to Him and thank God that He's made a way that He wants to forgive us. He's welcoming us back with open arms. He wants to help us to, to as a son, to get right. He wants to help us to get past those things, to kill the giants within us, as Brother Rob preached to us last Sunday morning. He wants to help us with those. He wants to defeat those giants. We, we can't defeat those things on our own. You know, uh, people try to, to defeat their giants from the outside in, don't they? They try to do it, uh, but, but we, we have to do it from the inside. Christ changes our hearts. He's the one who can change us. And I'm going to be mentioning that again tonight, but, but uh, how, how He can change us. But sim symbolically here, the Bible is telling us that uh, we need to have hearts and lives that are, that are clean. Look at what it says again in verse 22. It says, having our hearts sprinkled... Uh, with um, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our body washed with pure water. What's that a symbol of there? Well, he's talking about, in the Old Testament, Aaron the high priest, before he could enter God's presence, he had to wash his hands, he had to wash his feet, he had to go, go to that laver, and he had to, to get clean. He had to get his hands clean, his feet clean, before he could enter God's presence. And one occasion in the book of Exodus chapter 30 talks about how, um, or Exodus 30 talks about the duties of the high priest, but one time it says that Aaron washed his whole body, you know, and he probably, that was probably part of it every time, just washing. Why did he have to do that? Because he didn't want to go into the Holy of Holies unclean, and he wanted to be clean and ready to meet with God. And so we go to God, we, we, we go through, through confession, and we go through those things, uh, confessing our sins to God. We get ready and clean. How does that happen? It's by confessing our sin to Him. 1 John 1 9 says, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And what's the next word? To cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we can be clean, have our hearts sprinkled, having our, our, uh, having our uh, bodies washed with pure water. And we can go to Him. He, he washes us positionally. You know, He He's, he's forgiven us. We confess our sins to God when we get saved. But on a daily basis, if you want that fellowship with God, if you want to go, go boldly into God, you have to confess your sins to God. You know, we have to have a, a heart that says, I've sinned. I know who I am. I know who you are. Uh, Jeremiah uh, then says, uh, Jeremiah 29, verse 13 says, And ye shall seek me and find me when ye shall search with me, search for me with all your heart. You know, he says, let us come bold and stronger with a true heart, full assurance of faith. We should come with all of our heart. You know, not half-heartedly. You know, God knows when we're just coming half-heartedly to Him in prayer. God knows when you come to church and you're just kind of trying to sit through the sermon, bide your time until the preaching is done and, and get out of here. Uh, you know, He knows that, or, but he, he delights when somebody has a true heart and they're coming to Him with all their heart, a clean heart, wanting to hear from Him, humble heart, Wanting Him to help them. And so we can come to God boldly. Then it says in verse 23, it says, Let us hold fast our profession, the profession of our faith, without wavering. So we should come and be, we should come to Him faithfully. Without wavering, it says there. Hold fast our profession. Be faithful and hold on to your uh, profession. You know, He's not saying there to hold on to their faith. You know, Jesus Christ uh, let's look at verse 23. It says, Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering, for He is faithful that promised. You know, it's not that we have to hold fast to our salvation. Jesus is holding on to us. And, uh, you know, the Bible talks about how we're kept. He keeps us. The Bible says in 1 Timothy, or 2 Timothy, 1.12, it says, For I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that He is able, He is able to keep that which I have committed unto Him against that day. And, uh, you know, uh, if we had to keep ourselves, then we'd be in big trouble, wouldn't we? <laughs> we would never be able to keep ourselves. But, uh, but we know that, that we can come to Him. Uh, we can come to Him. Uh, uh, we, when we come to Him, we need to come to Him with faithfulness. And it says if we come to Him, His presence without wavering in our profession, He's pleased with that. He's pleased with people who are not ashamed that they professed Christ. I profess, but I'm not ashamed to be yours, God. He says, if you confess me before men, I'll confess you before my Father in heaven. 
you know, I, I think that that's a picture there of this, this idea of, of when you pray, when you approach God uh, as a Christian. You know, if, you, if you've been confessing Him before man, he'll, he'll confess you and say, yes, this is, this is James. He's, uh, he talks to me all the time. He's, he's faithful. He confesses. And, and li listen to this prayer. You know, we, we should be not ashamed to, to be called His. And uh, we, we can hold fast our profession that we've made in Him. And then, uh, then just remember that he, he is our high priest. We can come to Him with a pure heart. We can come to Him with faith, with sh full assurance of faith. You know, when I went into my dad's office, I knew that he would help me. And, uh, you know, when you come to God, you have full assurance of faith. You know that He'll help you. Amen. He'll help you. He'll, he'll, you're His son and, uh, or His daughter, and you can come to Him boldly. There's so many other things about uh, prayer that we can look at. There's, there's, there's uh, aspects of praying in God's will. There's aspects of praying together. Aspects of praying with fasting. Uh, all those types of things. Uh, I, I thought maybe we'd have time for those, but I think it's just too long of a list to go through this morning. And so, but the main thing I want you to know is that there's, there are certain things that, have to, that can be in place to help us get our prayers uh, answered even with even more boldness, but you can come to God. You can come to Him boldly. You can come in big. Why? Because He has made a way for you. The Bible uh, talks about Esther, when Esther had to go in before the king, and uh, she had to go to sit, try to save the lives of her people, the nation of Israel. And uh, Mordecai said, "Who knoweth if you've come to the kingdom for such a time as this?" And she said, "I can't go to the king without being invited, even as the queen." I'm not allowed to go into his presence, but uh, you know, but but uh, if the king lowers his scepter, that means that I can approach him. And uh, you know, but she, with great nervousness, she 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 built up her courage and she went to the throne room and she went in boldly and she approached the king and there came down the scepter. But I want to tell you that as a child of God, every time you come to him, if you're his child, he'll lower that scepter. There's no there's no reason why you're worthy enough to be there in that throne room. But because of the Lord Jesus Christ, because of what He did for you, He'll always lower that scepter to you. He'll always allow you to come and approach Him boldly. And uh, the song, Brother Rob's favorite song, And Can It Be, the last verse, it says, No condemnation now I dread. I am my Lord's and He is mine. Alive in Him, my living head, and clothed in righteousness divine. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. Bold I approach the eternal throne and claim the crown through Christ my own. We can approach boldly through Christ and through Christ alone. We're about to sing together page 449. To God be the glory, but in that song, To God be the glory, it says, Oh, come to the Father through Jesus the Son and give Him the glory, great things He hath done. We can approach